Oh, there we go. Alrighty, so today's September 25th. 26th. 26th, all right. And uh, my name is uh, Oz Hernandez, and I'm here with uh, Juan Daniel Garcia. And uh, if you could just uh, start off with, uh, let's see, uh, your occupation and your uh, date of birth, and your, or just full name, date of birth, and occupation. Uh, my name is Juan Daniel Garcia. Uh, my date of birth is April 24th, 1967. Uh, I've, my, I'm a social worker by trade. I work with Fort Worth ISD. I run a child development program through the school district here in Fort Worth. Um, and I've been either volunteered or worked in the community for about 30 years. Okay. Primarily Northside. All right. Okay. So um, with that in mind, um, let's see. Uh, I guess I'll start off by asking you, uh, where did your family come before uh, come to the U.S.? Uh, my father, my father was born on the corner of Northside Drive and Calhoun Street. There's four trees that, that are there now. So if you drive through, uh, if you're coming from Maine and you cross over towards the bridges, the empty lot on the left-hand side of my dad was born there on May 15, 1924. Uh, that side of Northside uh, was basically where Mexicanos lived, and we weren't allowed to cross the street. We had our own church. Uh, we had our own little community there. Um, my mother... My, my, grand, my, uh, my grandparents, which are my mom, mom and dad's, my, mo my mom and dad's dad, right? My mom and dad, no, my dad's mom and dad, I'm sorry. Uh, they passed away, my, my grandfather died when my father was three. My grandmother died when my dad was 17. Um, and he dropped out of school. That's him in the right-hand side of the, that's my prop. Um, he, um, uh, if I'm correct, they came over from Piedras Negras. They came over, I'm thinking probably turn of the century. And uh, pretty much came to work in the, the uh, right off the railroad. They took the railroad, and I'm sure you're familiar with this. They would jump on the railroad, ride it down to the Swift, mar uh, Swift plant, and then ride it back. That was a transportation. So everybody pretty much lived on the other side of Ma uh, the east side of Main Street, and that was their area. My mother was born in San Luis Potosí, uh, grew up in Monterrey, Mexico, Nuevo León. Uh, she came to visit my father back at, no, she came to visit All Saints Catholic Church. I owe, that, I owe my existence to that church and the community involvement. My aunt, uh, Benigna Gomez, Sister Benigna Gomez, who was a Guadalupana, uh, which is a form of Catholic nuns, an order, uh, was brought here in the early 60s by two gentlemen, Mr. Martinez and Mr. Hernandez, uh, from San Antonio. Uh, if you're not familiar with All Saints, I know I'm, kinda, I'm just going to speak if that's okay. My uh, All Saints Catholic School, uh, All Saints Catholic Church now was a white church. White people went to that church. You couldn't cross Maine. San Jose, which was across the street, across the across Maine, basically behind in like one half a block to the right of where the Mercado is now on Main Street. It's called the Men's Club now. That used to be San Jose. That was the Brown Church. Uh, my uh, when integration kind of came in, we were allowed to cross the street. Uh, exactly, that was sometime in the 40s, I think, late 30s. Uh, All Saints became integrated, and there was a large Latin, uh, Spanish speaking population that needed nuns to help serve, the religious or to serve them religiously. Uh, the Guadalupanas in San Antonio told them, Yes, you, you can have a, 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 a Spanish speaking nun, but you have to come get her. So Mr. Martinez and Mr. Hernandez went down and picked my tia up from San Antonio and brought her down here. She, I think she was one of the first, if not the first, Spanish speaking then in Fort Worth probably for sure north side. I don't know all of Fort Worth I'm not real sure about that part. So one of the first my mother came down early 60s was thinking about becoming a nun uh, And came to visit my aunt one summer My father who was uh, a great ball player in his time uh, Was playing baseball at night and working during the day uh, But his face was very strong. That's what my parents grandparents uh, instilled in him and he would go help the Guadalupanas make the masa for the tamales, the masa is the, uh, the cornmeal that they use to mix together and it's pretty thick and you got to mix it with different spices and camino and chile and pretty much bacon fat or fat, uh, fat to loosen up and soften it to get that moist spread on the tamal. My father was a very big athletic man so he could, he could ma podía masar la masa muy bien and uh, he would do that. So in between when he wasn't playing ball or, or working during the day, he came to do that in the evening. Well, he came in one evening and my mother was here. And he, uh, he's gone now. And um, he met my mother. My uh, godmother, 
who used to work at a, like a soda shop right off the corner of Chestnut and 25th Street. It's now going to be a Superior Torteria. It's right across from a grocery store. It used to be Hill's grocery store. And my dad went in there a couple, uh, well, he, he, say, he told me he immediately fell in love with my mom. So he goes in there like a week later and talks to my, my future godmother and tells her, oh, I met this woman. She's awesome. And he raved. And my, my mother, my godmother told me he had never, my, uh, her name is Alicia Castillo. I don't know what her maiden name was before. Uh, she tells me that he you know, he'd never seen her rant about anyone ever before like that. So he figured he's in love. We'll see what happens. So for the next, uh, I think, year and a half, my father would get on the bus because he didn't even have, he couldn't he didn't have a car. He would ride the bus from Fort Worth to Monterrey uh, every Friday evening. Uh, spend the get there early in the wee hours of the morning. Hang out in the plaza if you're familiar with the plaza in, in Mexico in, in cities in Mexico. And would wait till my uncle Alejandro would come out, who now lives in Houston to kind of convince my grandmother to allow my father to go into the house during the day. So he would sit there and then he would spend time with my mom. I don't know where he slept, but he didn't sleep in the house with them. That wasn't going to happen. And uh, he, would fly, he would drive the bus home. He would ride the bus home Sunday and then go back to work on Monday. He did that, I think, every other or at least once a month or every two weeks for about almost two years until he finally gained my, my grandmother's trust and he married my mother. I came over in what's called the pot. Uh, April, probably sometime late February, early March, because my dad told me we didn't, we wanted you to be born in America. My, they were married in Monterrey. My father was commuting with her until they got a house. They, we, I know our first, one of our first homes that we rented was right either on Calhoun or Jones Street, right behind me in, in the old neighborhood. And we lived there for a few years till we bought the house at, where my mom lives now on Ross. And um, uh, he brought me over and late February, early March, because he wanted me to become, he wanted me born, they both wanted me to become born American citizen. And uh, that's pretty much the, the lay, the foundation of where we came from. And uh, I brought this just because it was kind of cool. My father passed away about five years ago. And uh, one of my friends, somebody, my, one of my godsons, his grandpa had it in the garage and I blew it up and I put it into a poster board. And this kind of really sums up who my father was. And uh, before we get to that, um, just a little bit more um, mm -hmm. about the uh, neighborhood. Uh, yeah. This is the neighborhood in which you grew up with. Yeah, grew up in, and I still work in and okay. uh, worship in. I still, I still belong to Cat All Saints Catholic. Okay. And it's in the uh, north side neighborhood? The north side neighborhood. All Saints is located off of uh, 20th Street, and uh, it's on, it's, it's, it owns a whole block between Ellis and Houston on 20th Street, right across from Marine Park. Okay. Uh, it's probably one of the oldest Catholic churches. It has the old, one of the oldest Catholic school in Fort Worth, or one of the oldest, I should say. Um, in, in when it first was started by the Diocese of Fort Worth, it was the, the Anglo Church. And then when uh, we were allowed to cross Main Street, that became integrated, and then that became the, the neighborhood church for everyone. Okay. Now, how was the uh, Northside neighborhood when you were growing up? It was, uh, it was, quite, it was quite split. I was born in 67, I remember 72, 73. I never went to public school. Um, went to Catholic school there at All Saints. Uh, but you could tell the, the dynamics. The older people lived literally right off of Maine. And Latinos were still living on the east side of Maine and uh, upper part of west, the west side of Maine, which would be like from 21st and worked its way up to towards Grand. And then we had started moving towards Diamond Hill, which would be the north the northeast part of the north side and what was called Loma, which was right up the hill off a of long street. And Lo Loma stands for hill and then it was up on the hill. Uh, but there was quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of uh, Anglo population still living here. And the church back then, the dynamic was pretty much split. It was 50-50 or 60-40 white. As I started to grow, uh, the Anglo population moved further west and moved into Vickery, the, or Fernanda Hewlin and Cambui, which was already populated by them, but had moved further, and then Latinos pretty much took in all, the majority of Northside. And by the time I figure in the 80s, it was 70, 30. And now I would say it's 90, 10, maybe flipping back over, more people are coming back and buying homes and, and refurbishing them. So uh, yeah, the dynamics in the neighborhood when I was growing up was quite different than it is now. Where Billy Bob's was, is there was a shopping strip and there was a thing, it was called Cook's, K-O-O-K-S. And Cook's was like a poor man's uh, uh, Kmart. There was a Kmart on Jacksboro 
and right in front of Lake where the Jacksboro 820. Mm -hmm. And when we had money, we would go there and buy what we needed. But when we didn't, we would go to Cook's. And it was right up, it was literally where Billy Bob's was. Actually, I think I was three or four. We had this old blue Plymouth with the big fenders on it. And we, had, we used to go in every Saturday. And uh, my, I remember I was a big Batman fan. And there was this little stick'em toy thing that he would buy me because I'd always lose a part. So every couple months he'd buy me a new one. It was like a buck something. And I remember he bought me a new one because I messed up my own. And we were walking out of the, we were walking out of Cook's and it was a Saturday night and I'd never seen my father so angry in my entire life. Someone had stolen our car, the only car we owned, uh, and the uh, first car I think maybe my dad owned because, he, you know, my grandma said you better have a car or she's not going with you. And uh, so I'm, I remember clutching this and my mother freaking out because it was just the three of us at the time my sister wasn't born yet. And, I, and my dad was like, our car was gone. Somebody stole our car. If you know where Los Vaqueros restaurant is now, off, the, off of, uh, right off of 28th and Main, that used to be a slaughterhouse. Well, it was abandoned. It had been abandoned quite a long time. And where the stairs, wooden stairs right now where you walk up, that was a big garage. Someone had stolen it, drove it in there, because that's where they found it, and literally took everything of value, which was I think maybe the tires and the battery and a couple other things, maybe even the radio, and then the, uh, uh, pretty much destroyed the car. Because I remember vaguely us walking over there saying they found it because we were literally just walking around the park and I'm freaking out. And back then, the police officers didn't really care about us. We were more of a nuisance than anything else, to be perfectly honest with you. And uh, I remember walking that way and I remember seeing the car just completely destroyed. All the windows were busted out. Everything was beat up. They never found out who did it. And I, every time I go to Los Vaqueros or drive by it, I always think about, well, that's where our first car was stolen and destroyed. So... Um, and, and what year was this again? I would say probably the early 70s, 70, 71, 70, 71. I was three or four. Okay. I remember holding on to my Batman game and crying, and then I remember seeing the car beat the heck out of mm -hmm. And I was like, man, this is... And I remember my mother saying, we need to move. We need to move. And we were still living on that side of Maine. A couple years later, we moved to Ross and 20th Street, where my mother, 21st Street, where my mom lives now. And, um, and uh, well, it actually, it kind of helped because we were to get a, new, a newer car. Then we picked up, like, we got a Ford white Ford four-door car and it had air conditioning because we never had air conditioning. So it was kind of cool. So, you know, you know, out of bad things, good things come, you know, so. And, and you did mention about um, CE police relations. Um, they were bad. They were bad. At best, they were bad. Yeah. You know, uh, there was a, it, it, even to this day at times, if it's a, if it's a night and it's a shooting and there's, there's 911 called in police and uh, an ambulance comes in, uh, response times are horrible. They're one of the hard worst in the city. Them in Poly probably now. Back then they were pretty bad. Um, in the 70s things were okay, but we were still a nuisance. Cowtown was barely developing. I remember when they knocked down Cooks, it was like we were emotionally distraught because that was our store. Then they put up Billy Bob's, which was a white honky tonk, like you know. And they were revitalizing the stockyards, and we're going like, this is crazy. And I remember a lot of uh, kids cruising through the stockyards you know, off of Ellis and Exchange, in that area, and just people throwing bottles at each other. Prostitution going up on the corner, people selling weed off of angling. You know, you could buy weed on any of the local garages. You know, you could buy, people were selling, always selling stuff. And uh, relations with the police were pretty bad. Uh, I'd say I probably, just guesstimating off the top of my head, I don't remember seeing a brown officer in Northside till I was probably a teenager. You know, I pretty much, the population that was, that was living in that community wasn't being represented in the police force and that didn't happen for a very long time. And I'm 48 years old, so. Right. Okay. Um, let's see here. And the um, okay, so we did cover of the uh, schools that you attended, um, so uh, St. Joseph's and All Saints. Yeah. So we kind of went over that. Um, Can I give you a tidbit on Nolan? That was just yeah, kind. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in a very, I like to think a very open and broad uh, home, home and community. Lived in Northside all my life. Uh, my father didn't want me to go to public school. I think he had a right to do it. I probably would have been in a lot of trouble. Um, so to, to be around a lot of white people, no offense, uh, was very, it, it wasn't that uncomfortable because we, we used to go to Northeast Mall. We used to go to Seminary South, which is where Laguna Plaza is now. You know, and that was pretty open, but it was pretty, it was, it was pretty mixed, but that's where you'd go for everything. And then once Northeast Mall opened, that's where we constantly went. So being around Anglos wasn't that big a deal, but it was a huge building, and that's what you saw mostly in there. This is 82, you know, 82, 83. I went to high school at, no, uh, no, I'm sorry, late 70s. I went to Nolan in 81 as a freshman. And uh, I remember at Nolan, the only, still the only uh, Catholic high school in the area, north in Fort Worth. 
And uh, my father, I remember getting the talk from my father, you know, you're brown, don't start saying your name in English because you know, that's not your name. You have, I speak, I'm fluent in Spanish. Um, don't screw this up. You know, you'll regret it. He would have beat the crap out of me probably. But I don't know if he would have, but he would have been upset. So I said, okay, gotcha, Dad. And, and you, you hear all these things about stories and in our senior retreat, all these other anglers saying, oh, I love Nolan, this and that, and my sister went and my brother went, or I was the first one to go and I was excited. They knew what to expect and I did too, but for them it was like a joyous time. For me, it was probably one of the most traumatic -ish things that ever happened to me in high school. Uh, they bust us from All Saints to Nolan, all of us together. And my eighth grade class, which was the class of 81, was probably the largest all class from All Saints to go to Nolan and since, I think, in the last 35 years. There was like 18 of us that went. And graduated, it was only 11 or 12. Something, to, something like that. So we're getting there, and, and you get there, and I remember we had been at, and this is back in the Blue Laws, so Sundays the mall was closed. So I remember Saturday we had gone to Sears at Northeast Mall, and we were picking up a few things that I needed. And mind you, I was comfortable there. It was wide open, you know, you weren't restricted like being at school. But I get to Nolan and the door opens and I get off with all my brown friends and, then, and as I'm walking down to come out of the bus, I look around and I see a mass of kids. I'm like, this is wild, this is cool. But then as soon as I focus, I see nothing but white people. I had never seen, and, and I expressed in that retreat that year, I had never seen so many white people in a building. Uh, the last time we seen that many white people in a building was at Northeast Mall that Saturday before. So I was like, I was freaking out. Well, all these people, it was a joyous and momentous occasion. And for me, it was probably one of the most terrifying moments I ever had in my life. Because then everything my dad told me not to do and to watch myself started coming back. It's like, oh, this is what this man meant. Because I, there was a, you could count in one hand the people of color at that school that I could see. And for me, that was shock. And I thought I came from a very open-minded, very liberal family that, oh, you know, and, and, was, I, and I just seen all these, this, this situation. But at the mall, but school was different. So for me to keep my identity because of where I grew up, because of Northside, because of my father and my mother and what they have done, what they instilled in me, uh, made it a little more traumatic that first semester for me. But, you know, and, and you take things for like that for granted that, you know, you're in this, this population with all your own you know, people of color. But then when you go to another area, you've got to remember who you are and where you come from. And there's nothing wrong with becoming and, and uh, evolving into something else, uh, or um, I can't think of the term, I'll bring it up to you, I'll bring it up in a minute, but uh, uh, it's not so much about a simulation, it's more it's about just kind of like uh, accepting what's there and making it your own, but not forgetting who you are and where you come from. So that first couple of years, if it wasn't for my father and, what he inst and my mother, what they instilled in me, I don't think I would have made it. Because a lot of people left because of that, or that was their excuse to leave. Now, Nolan, uh, where, where was that located? Nolan's off of, it's still there, it's off of Bridge Street, off of 30 in Oakland. It's in the east side of Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty segregated, I mean, not segregated, but it's in its own entity, in its own side. And then even there, the homes around it were very, were very upscale, very uh, upper middle class. So uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a culture shock, you know, for me to wear, to wear a uniform was one thing. Everybody wore it at All Saints, Catholic, but we were all brown. But here you could wear a uniform, but... I was wearing t I was wearing uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Oxfords and stuff that were from like Montgomery Wards and Sears, and people were wearing pullovers had polo and all this other stuff on it. So it was like then all of a sudden you start seeing there was a difference, you know. Uh, I think my sophomore and my junior and senior year, I, I purposely started wearing Stacy Adams to school. Everyone wore boots and hush puppies, and I started wearing Stacy's. If you want, if you know what Stacy's are, they're, they're pant leather shoes with a, a steel tip that the Cholos used to wear. So I chose to wear that as, you know, because you really couldn't express yourself, and that was one of the few ways I could. So if you wore dark slacks, a blue shirt, and those, in my neighborhood, you thought I was a gangbanger, but when I went to Nolan, I was a student. So the image that I was portraying in one was completely different than, you know, now people knew me like, oh, he doesn't run with anybody, he doesn't run with VNS, he doesn't run with VQS, he's not that. But the people at Nolan were looking at me like, oh, he must be a gang member, look how he dresses. Like, so you, see, you would see a lot of that. And, you know, and then my freshman year, I was uh, befriended because all my classes, God has a way of kind of, kind of giving you some signs. Um, my five, six friends that I call brothers that my sons call Theo, uncle, are all Anglo because none of my brown friends were in my classes and it was either sink or swim and that's where I developed my sink or swim for myself. Either find someone you can hang out with and relate to, they're all Anglo. Uh, they're all like I was lower, middle to lower class, pretty much economically for the 80s. But we all had the same, we were all down to earth, we were all raised by our parents. We lived in Fort Worth and Arlington in the mid-cities in East Fort Worth. 
but we all had the same kind of kinship for each other. And they would let me express my militant side every now and then. And other times they'd tell me to be quiet and just be one, of, you know. And when I was trying to use it for things that I shouldn't be, he's like, come on now, chill. But then they took me in. So to sit there and say, well, I was shunned. They go, no, actually, I, uh, they helped me get through high school. I tell people there's no way I would have finished school without them. And so you can say, well, this is who I am, yes, but I didn't lose my identity. And I was the first one of us from All Saints to actually um, kind of acclimate myself quickly to the point to where second semester, you heard it, Danny turned white. My nickname is Danny. Danny turned white. And I'm like, well, that's cool. To the point to where my mother calls me in one day because she had talked to some of the other moms. Goes, que me dice que, que estás con puro bolio? Because she hadn't met any of my friends. And I go, well, yeah, my mom goes, what's well, Nolan? It's no, nothing but mostly white people. What do you mean hanging out with white people? She goes, I heard you're hanging out with white people. I go, well, David and then, then, then Brad and Modesto, he's Puerto, half Puerto Rican, but he's white. And it's like, they're all white, mom. I mean, what do you want me? You're happy that I'm doing okay, but now that you're being told that your son maybe isn't who he thinks he is or portraying himself in a way he isn't, or you didn't trust me. And we had a big discussion about that. But um, I've learned to just, people can say what they want. But I needed to survive for myself, and these men helped me keep my identity, but showed me how to, I can evolve into something much more and become a better person for it. And uh, you hear me talk now, you, you know, if I introduce to them, people are like, oh, who the hell are they? And then all my sons, I'll call them uncle. They're tios. They're, that's their family. And that's a bond that started with my parents and in Northside. But they also had it where they came from. But being a person of non-color, you'd figure, no, there's no way. But there's a way of, you know, society, God and, and uh, situations that kind of give you a direction and a, a, a spirituality. Because that's what it is. It, it's a spirituality and guidance that you get. And that's something that was instilled in me from a small child. My Catholicism is very important to me, even though I don't agree with a lot of what's happened. And it's gone on and been pushed under the table. But a lot of things, uh, my foundation, that's where it starts. Being, like, being a Mexicano, being, uh, being from Northside and being Catholic. You know, that's, that's pretty much, it. that's my, 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 my all, really. Now, um, you uh, mentioned that you were getting bused. Was that part of the integration that uh, well, you were to Well, it was a Catholic school, so we weren't in the public school system. But the only way you could get there is either if you had your own car to take you, but my dad was a dri truck driver. There's no way he could take me. Mm -hmm. And most of the other Catholic schools would bus him in as well. Okay. But the other, and even the weird thing about that is everyone had a big bus. Okay, I don't know if you ever heard of the short bus or like I used to play a coach basketball when you say short bus you talk about people with uh, learning disabilities, you know, so We we literally were driven in a, in a short bus. We had a little bus So on top of just being the one of the few all brown buses. We were also in the short bus So now you've got a plethora of, of jokes racial slurs um, Perceptions of you that really was like we laugh about it now But back then it would bother us and sometimes we laugh it off, too but it's like, you know, it gave them one, one more thing, one more little trinket to get at us about. Because the, there was also that one uh, faction of uh, Nolan that was very upper. You know, kids were all drove Beamers. And in the 80s, that was unheard of, you know. And they came from very well families. Their parents dropped them off, you know. My dad would come pick me up from football practice at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night. So I get off of school and we'll all be sitting in the circle at Nolan doing homework at night with flashlights because they turn the lights off after a while and we're just waiting on our right. Because we live so far away, nobody lived where we lived. Or people would go out of the way when they could to drop us off. So just to see, and then to leave the neighborhood was, was, wasn't as impactful as where we were because we were very, pretty much it's a prep school. To college prep school. So what you're involved in and the mentality there was quite different than what you would see in the public school. There were really no gangs. Everyone was talking about college this and college that and my dad went here and my dad didn't finish high school. My mother has a sixth grade education. But they were both, my mother didn't speak any English. My father was fluent in both languages. Very intelligent and articulate man. But, uh, you know, we drove a 78, uh, 78 Toronto, uh, is it Toronto? Uh, uh, station wagon for like forever because tuition was expensive. So everyone's driving these really nice cars and we got this with like this nasty tint that's falling off the sides and this old beat up station wagon, but I was okay with it. But you felt, you, you, you know, people would look at you funny or they would say your name, like my name and ro roll the first few times in freshman class, they'd laugh because they never heard it and I liked that's how I wanted it. I went to Danny I said, well, I like to be called Danny. So then that went, oh, he's turning white. But that's always been my nickname. But my full name is Juan Daniel Garcia. That's my name. I mean, oh, you have a middle name? No, that is my name. 
You know, where I come from, you don't have a middle name. That, tu nombre completo. Úsalo todo. It's your complete name. Use it all. And that comes from my father and my mother. So, I kind of hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah it does. Now, um, as far as any um, community, social, and political organizations, were you involved in? Um, uh, LULAC was really prevalent and growing when I was growing up. Okay. My father was very, he didn't like a lot of that. A lot of the people that he grew up with, Sam Garcia and some of them, mm -hmm. my dad couldn't stand them. They were hypocrites, he said. Mm -hmm. You can quote me on that. Uh, uh, he said, you, uh, it goes back to the old saying, there's a, um, Jack Lemon is an uh, older actor. Uh, just passed away. He was part of the Odd Couple and a few other things. You look him up. He had a saying, and I just was introduced to this. It's like, uh, he's mentored other actors, and they would say, you know, when you get to that point where you're at on that elevator, make sure you send that elevator back down for everybody else. And my father was by the people that went, got to that point, never sent the elevator back down, or sent, came down with it and picked certain people and took them with them. So he pretty much said, screw this. I'm out. You know, so for me, LULAC was like a dirty word. It, you know, they did do some good work in the 60s and the 70s, but as the 80s progressed, they started sitting on their laurels and not doing a whole lot and just helping themselves. And you do a scholarship fund, okay, well, but is there any activism to it? Is there any movement? And my father was, was bitter at that for them for doing that. My father could be, is it okay if I cuss? My father could be the biggest asshole in the world, but if, you, if he knew you needed, if you, had, if you had your back, you never had to worry. He'd be there no matter what. But if you turned on him, or you, uh, you showed unfaithfulness to him, he turned his back on you quicker than you could. And my father was like that. And I think that's another reason why he was maybe blackballed. He didn't do as well economically because he'd opened his mouth. And so when he tried looking for a better job to provide for us, he was a route salesman. He was a route salesman in Vandenborg's ice cream over there off of South Main, right up the street from JPS. It's still there. I think they just do milk now. And uh, uh, the, my dad said, like when Luis, Luis Zapata went to school with his son, uh, he, he, my father grew up with him and a few others. There were behind, a, few, a couple, a few years behind him. And he would say, well, why aren't they opening up? And at times you would see more people of Latinos, more people of color being introduced into the political system. But they weren't bringing anybody with them. They'd close that door. That elevator never came back down. And I think now it's beginning to be brought. It is being brought down now. And more people are being, are, 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 anyone can get on. You know, good or bad, indifferent, for selfish reasons, for community reasons. And it's evolving, but back then, it was a small, tight, night, uh, nice, tight group. And if you got in good, and if you're not, you were kind of on your own. And that's where my father was at. He and uh, Rufino Mendoza Sr. were, uh, were good. Uh, was a good, other, a good man. He did a lot of good work, and, but he knew how to kind of maneuver in the political system more so than my father. But he was a man that, uh, one of the few men from that time that I, I hold a high regard for. They named the elementary school off of Central and and Denver after his name. I went to school with his two twin daughters. I coached uh, about seven or eight of his grandkids. Uh, his grandson's a lieutenant in the poly, uh, over in the poly sector. He's uh, Rick Mendoza officer. And um, he's, uh, he was very, I would run into him all the time and we'd always have conversations. My father's name was Isidro Escareño Garcia and everybody called him Cider. And uh, people didn't like him. Well, you're Cider's boy. And didn't make that face. And I never knew what that was when I was little. I was like, I guess I don't like my dad. But it was for. But Mr. Mendoza always had good things to say about my father. He would always say good things about me, and uh, I, I hold that man in high regard. So. All right. And now, uh, so uh, you mentioned here that you were uh, you volunteered in the Latino community uh, for over thirty years. Mm -hmm. So just uh, talk about a little bit more on um, your uh, part on it, like on, on the thirty years that you've been uh, working. Working. Yeah. <coughs> Um, I've been blessed to be able to either work or volunteer. I first graduated from Nolan. I went to TCC, and my sister was still at All Saints Catholic School. I have a, six, a sister six years younger than myself, and they needed someone to coach track, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. It was uh, when I left Nolan. I graduated well, did okay, nothing fancy, right, but I uh, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I uh, was given the opportunity to co help coach the track team. So I literally did that for a couple years, and that's where, and I was still going to church regularly, things my parents instilled in me at All Saints. And uh, was just, I was going to school, I was cutting meat. I was a meat cutter at what was, what is now is Monterrey a Supermarket right there off of 28th and Roosevelt. Okay, and uh, I was doing that and I was volunteer coaching. And you don't know what, how things are impactful to people. I did that for two years as a volunteer. Uh, that third year, which would make me about 20, uh, the, uh, the PE teacher quit the second day of the of the second day of a class. 
The parents like me so much, and, and this is something that'll start coming up. Community, if you're good to the community, the community will be good to you. They'll help you find that job. They will put they will co-sign when you want. They'll co-sign for you with people. Some parents were talking, it's like, well, so and so just quit. We need a PE teacher. And then he goes, Well, what do you have? I had a, you know, about 30, 20, I had like maybe you know, 15, 16 hours of college. And they go, Well, what did they do? Well, she taught PE. She was gonna run the athletic department. They were just starting the sports back up through the diocese, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And she was teaching Spanish to kin, uh, kin, uh, first, second, and third. And it's like, and who are they gonna pay? And they were paying like eight hundred dollars a month. I was like, it was not, you know, this is 88, 88, 89. And uh, the, the Rodriguez's, uh, the Martinez's, the Gomez's says, hey, we got the perfect guy for you. And I got a call. Literally, I was cutting meat and I got a call. And they said, Tony, Tony Rodriguez, who's a fireman through the city right now, um, he comes up, uh, his daughter ran for school board, ran for school board president for a while. He goes, hey, he goes, I gotta, are you interested in changing jobs? I, I was like soaking in blood because I had gotten off a of school and I was cutting meat. I go, yeah, it'd be nice. He goes, well, do you think you want to be the PE teacher at All Saints? I go, excuse me? It wasn't a core subject, so you didn't have to have a degree, and I had enough college, they'd let me have it. I said, okay. So um, he goes, Mr. O'Shea, the principal's going to call you. Okay. I'm thinking, yeah, right, whatever. And I went back to cut my meat. Sure, sure enough, Mr. O'Shea calls me that a couple, an hour later. Hey, could you come in? That was a Tuesday. Can you come in tomorrow in the morning? Go, yeah, I don't have a class till 10. I, yeah, sure, I can come in. About 8.30, 8.15, 8 okay. So I come in at 8.15. I have something I want to talk to you about. And Tony had already prepped me for it. So I said, okay. So I go in there. Uh, I go in there at 8.15. This is, for me, that this is where I knew what my calling was, was working with community of kids, maybe not in the school base, which is what I'm doing now, which is kind of weird. Um, I walk in there at 8.15. I walk out of there about 8.15. 48, 35, somewhere in there. I walk out as a PE teacher for first through eighth, the athletic director for the sports teams, and the Spanish teacher for second and third. As a 20 year old with 16 hours of college, but because I'd been there for two years helping and organizing, like get the uniforms, run them. You know, they didn't do background checks back then. So they didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any prior, I didn't, I mean, I didn't even think I had any speeding tickets at the time. And, but because I, they gained my trust, I was good with kids. You know, I'd take kids home, you, things you can't do now, but I, nothing, my, my actions were never questioned in any, you know, in any negative manner. He gave, I got the job. I did that for about four and a half years and worked with a lot of good kids. Uh, school board superintendent for ISD, that's one of my boys. Uh, Rick Mendoza, lieutenant in the poly area, runs the poly sector at night, that's one of my boys. Uh, Dr. Tony Uranga uh, used to be uh, the, uh, he, he was the head of the pediatric department at uh, Santa Rosa Hospital in San Antonio, you know. A uh, plethora of nurses, social workers, therapists, uh, and that's where it started for me. And then from there, my next job was through challenging through Ann Rice. Uh, again, Ms. Gomez, uh, another parent said, hey, that's job opening. You got to go apply. You'd be perfect for it. And I never, I worked in the community, but I worked in Northside. This was more on Diamond Hill. And I was, and I got the job. And then from there, it just sort of took off. So pretty much 80% of where I've been most of my life included Northside and working in the community, always giving back in some way. You hear stories like one, one boy, uh, this was back in, I'd already left, I forgot where I was at. This was mid nineties. I was at a wedding and I ran into one of the young men I used to coach. He goes, come here, you got it. Have you met my fiance or my girlfriend? I know. And he brought him over. This is the one, this is the one. I'm like, my God, what did we do? What, what, what did I, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that, what did you tell them? That, you know, I had them with me everywhere when they were younger and I'd coach them and we'd go do something. He goes, this is the guy. He came from a very good family. His parents are divorced now. He lost his mother a few months back. And um, he said, this is the guy. And I'm like, what did we do? I'm terrified, right? He says, a lot of times I used to take them out of Six Flags and, I, and we'd all go to Six Flags and I always make sure they had money to go over to Cheddar's, which is across the street from Six Flags. You think about the impact you make with people and young people. And um, I'd say bring, you know, seven or eight, not ten dollars, and you get, you can, have, you know, we'd, we'd sit. And uh, I remember the first time I took the basketball team, and he was one of them then. Everybody had their food, and back then, it was just like now, all your drink refills are free. So everybody had their Coke, and they're just sitting there. I'm, I think I have three before they go, Coach, man, that's going to be expensive. And I told them, no, refills are free. They freaked out. You know, and most of them had both, not, not all of them, but most of them had their, both had their parents. They were pretty active. They, they went out. They weren't just living in Northside. They did things in, all over the city. But for me to think, these kids didn't even know you can get free refills. Well, it, wasn't, it was one of those times that I took him that he told her, well, that, the, that he told his girlfriend, that was, I was the man that took him to his first restaurant where you had silverware and a cup laid out. Now, you may not think, for me, that's very powerful. He came from a very good family. 
He had a good job. His parents were both in the home. And he was exposed to a lot of different positive things. But to hear that I did that for him and he found that impactful, that he had to go get his girlfriend to tell me, that's something that I can, no money can ever give me. And I'm thinking like, oh God, maybe he took the time that I took him over here, you know, or I kept him out late bowling until two in the morning and people were wondering where we're at or what, you know, we didn't do anything bad, but you, you wonder. Another young man, he's a very a good professional, loves Batman. When Batman, Michael Keaton movie came out, I took them all. We want to go see Batman, but all our parents would be, okay. So I took them all to go see Batman. I took like eight of them to go see Batman. We would do that. You, you think you do little things. He's a huge Batman fan because I took him to that movie. Little things that you think, well, I'm going anyway. Why don't I take them with me? Or you think you're going out of your, you, you don't think it's a big deal, but to them it is. It's very impactful. So one thing I've learned over the last 30 years, nothing that you do or work with people um, is, in, is in, insignificant of any type because you don't know what you're doing for them. An act of kindness, n not just from a person of, of, of your own ethnicity, but a person who's just there for you to help, that you don't really have to do that, but you do it because you want to or because it's just the right thing to do or because why not? It's, it's impactful in ways you never know. When you have grown men and women telling you stories to their, now they're to their kids because I'm 48. Now I'm, I'm hearing their kids telling their kids all oh, this and then I've coached some of their kids and like well, does he still yell yeah sometimes he yells just like he used to and things of that nature but yeah, the little things are impactful in the community and I don't think we had enough of that we had people who were politically savvy and active but they just didn't give back we still have people now that do that and that pretty much disgusts me because they say oh I'm here no you're not you're here for yourself I'd rather just you tell the truth and then move on and let the rest of us do our work that we got to do because I still do that I still work I'm still I'm still a youth minister at Catholic All Saints Catholic um, we still, my kids are in confirmation class now. Uh, I still coach the softball team. We won, uh, we won first place in the Dyson softball tournament. Uh, last time they, All Saints won that 21 years ago, I coached that team. I mean, you know, there's, uh, I, I try to, and I try to relate to them the history. I try to bring kids back to tell them stories and, you know, uh, uh, um, I, I, I'll use Officer Mendoza. He was on that team. He was also the DH on the 94 team that won state at Heights. He went five for five in state in the state championship, tied a state record, is still a state record to this day. He was my first baseman on that team. So I had him come back and talk to him a week before we left, because I think I thought we had a shot at winning it. As it's been 21 years, Rick, since we won this thing, I want you to come talk to him. Oh, and by the way, bring your state medal. And in the end, he couldn't come talk to him, but he's gonna come by and see him later. But it's, it's about reconnecting with the kids and what you do now. And it's not as impactful because they really are, they are more diverse, but they don't think about things that have happened in the past. You know, we put the trophy in the trophy case, then I show them all these other eight or nine, they were one in the mid, early 90s, by all these people that are grown adults that are as old or older than their parents, and they go, I never knew that. We don't teach enough. The things I know that I've told you about is because I sat with my father, or around the time my father was passing away, people shared things with me, or I picked my father's brain. Or we would sit there and watch the Ranger game. And baseball was one of our big loves. So for us, it was a good way of just bonding, you know, pitch counts, you know. Uh, hit and run situation, whatever, right? He was lined up wrong. Or, that's a great catch. My father would always, my dad was a great baseball athlete. People have told me, I never saw any of it. That, you know, he's all, hell, the reason he made a fabulous catch is because he read the damn ball wrong and he took off, you know. But uh, people would say your dad was being critical. Yes, but my dad was that good that he knew what they did or didn't do right. But people didn't see that in my father. They just saw an older man who was either bitter because he never got to play in the, in the major leagues. He played for a team called the Aztecas and the Apaches after it evolved. They had a few of those that went to the major leagues to play with the Brooklyn Dodgers and a few other teams. He never got to go and they said he was one of the more talented ones. But I think his attitude and his, his uh, brazen, uh, uh, pers uh, brazen personality probably put him in a bad spot. So, sorry. I'm no, that's fine. No. Um, and uh, let's see. So uh, just to get a, like a time period um, when you started off um, oh. late, late uh, 80s. I started like 88, 89. Okay. Uh, taught at All Saints to about 92. Okay. Then the, the, the community, it was a drug and alcohol prevention program from 92 to about 93. Then I was the original coordinator for what's called the Coming Up program, which is a gang intervention program to the Boys Club. Actually, Bob Terrell, the city manager at the time, goes, this job would be perfect for you. Again, community and people knowing how good at what you do. And said, you need to go take this job, it'd be perfect for you. So a guy that lived in the hood, in the barrio, but went to Catholic school all his life, was going to work with gang members. Um, uh, when we first started Northside, and it's still running to this day, uh, we, put, we put it on a good foot and foundation. I left two years later, uh, but uh, that kind of showed me how you re it, kids are kids, and if you really help them, and some kids are in a better situation than others, and if you can redirect them, you'll be surprised. That was back during the, um, 
Dangerous Minds movie and all that mentality in the, in the you know, uh, NWA and all that, all the uh, gangster rap and, you know, gang, uh, 76106, which is the Northside area, which is 164 area, 76164. We had the highest crime and gang activity in the country. It was bad. You know, and it was mostly, you know, you had, you know, when I was growing up, there was two or three gangs. Uh, uh, then I think at one time I, I had 10 to 11 different gangs come in into my center at night because it was late, late night programming to work with. So that was kind of different and I evolved and I did a few other things after that. And, but my, my community work is always, in the 90s you could see quite a bit of, there was money being pumped into communities for gang. Gang was a thing and drugs. And a lot of it was north side, south side, poly, east side. So you would see a lot of you know, people coming in, but again, People, uh, you're bringing uh, an organization or a group or a program, but it wasn't reflective of the population you're trying to work with. We're not saying all of it, but some of it, or relate in some way. A lot of those programs either failed or just did their funding for four years or five years and moved on because there wasn't any connection there, because there wasn't any real true uh, connection or, or uh, wanting to better themselves. It was more of, okay, I'm going to get paid pretty good for a couple of years, then I can use it on my resume and move to something else. And the community to this day has built up a tolerance of, ah, you're here, four years you'll be gone. And the weird thing with me is I have a, I, I oversee 12 social workers. We do child development and it's called the Texas Home Visitation Program. And I've been, yeah, and we work all over Fourth ISD in the city's district limits. And I tell them, go see so-and-so, go see so-and-so. And they go, oh, they know you and so-and-so knows you and this and that. And it, all that comes from the fact that I've been here for such a long time, but I've really been fair and honest and I've done what I think. I've screwed up sometimes but never for personal reasons. And it was never for me to better myself. Maybe that's why I, for a few years there, I, uh, uh, financially I didn't do as well, but I really did help a lot of people. And to the point to where I'm at now, all of that I helped, um, helps me to get into communities that are, or situations that people wouldn't get into just because, oh, you're the guy that used to do car seats for the city. Or you're the guy that helped my brother with his community service hours. Or you're the guy from the, like, like the young lady in the front, oh, you're with Young Life from All Saints. Yeah, you know. If they see you in, in, in the neighborhood and doing things and you take ownership for yourself, they're more, much more willing to share with you or to work with you or to be accept what you're trying to offer them that isn't just there for a couple of years or you know, you're there to get that check and then you're leaving. And a lot of people in the community uh, seem to think that because of what's happened over the last 10, 15 years. Okay. All right. Um, and, um as far as like uh, black and brown relations um, growing up, um, was there, um, how, how, would you, how would you describe that? At times, yeah. we were both in the same boat, mm -hmm. and at times we were envious of them mm -hmm. because the old theory was, if something happened in North uh, in Fort Worth to a brown person, well, they'd have to have a meeting to discuss who would, who would help who because not everybody likes each other. Mm -hmm. And that would take the president over trying to do something. Um, I'll give you an example. When Bob Terrell was still city manager, Bob and I still have this discussion sometimes. Uh, some water, water, and I can't remember exactly, a water, a city workers for the water department, there was a letter, something derogatory, something, and I can't remember what it was. It was racially motivated, and uh, they were reprimanded for something, but in a very racially toned letter. Lula gets up in a big whip, in a big whim, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And then the only thing that ended up happening is uh, the city manager sent them a, 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 an apology letter, and that was it. And some of us in the community said, well, if Lulac really was who Lulac was, if that had been an African-American employee, there was like three or four employees, they would have banded together and something would have been done and they would have been given their, I think they were like laid off or something. They would have given their time back, they would have been gotten paid, they would have gotten something more than what just a th uh, I'm sorry letter. And, you, and, and, I, and to, to this day, I don't think it's as true, but still evolves that when something happens in the African-American community, they'll all jump on top, on board, whether they like each other or not, and fight for that one cause and get it done. Well, we still have that issue of, well, well who's going to help you? We still have some of that. You know, they go, I'll help you, but oh, let me ask you first, who's going to help you? Uh, it's the old, uh, have you heard the one about the lobsters and the barrels, right? Yeah. 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 You know, you have, guy walks in, there's three barrels, white barrel, black barrel, uh, uh, Mexican barrel. The white and, um, and the black barrel, they're covered. And the, guy, and the, the Mexicano barrel is empty, or Latino barrel is, is, is uh, tops off. He goes, why is that? He goes, well, if we open the white or the black, they all get out and they'll climb over each other and they'll help each other get out. On the Latino one, you don't have to worry about it. As soon as one comes to the top, one of the other one grabs them and pulls them back down. And that was a big thing, because Fort Worth is considered a good old boy town. 
And to a certain extent, that still happens politically, community-wise, everything. But you're, there's more of a movement to get away from that. You saw a lot of that in the 90s with monies and funding and everyone would jump in. And then as soon as the media showed up, forget it. Everyone and their mother wanted to be in there or we did or whatever. Or, or you know, they would try to literally badmouth each other in front of everyone. It's like, how about just everybody sharing the pie, which is what we're, you know, a lot of us, I think, in the community now want to do. There's, a, there's, big, there's enough here for everyone to get their portion, their, you know, their uh, PR moment. Why not just share it? And that's, I think we're headed that way. I think we should be further along than what we are. But um, hopefully with things like this, this will maybe, because a lot of people don't know that you couldn't cross Main Street. You know, my dad used to tell me stories of, they used to walk up Marine Park towards Elder, which is now North, which is Elder, J.P. Elder Middle School, which is, used to be Northside. There would be people, there would be white people trying to pick fights with you, not to let you go to school. And my dad, if he was in a bad mood, would obligate. He had no problem with that. You know, and it's like, all we want to do is go get an education. Why do you have to stand in our way? We don't cross the street. And that was the other thing. They'd, you know, they'd cross the street and mess with each other. And then when that tide turned and we were able to, it became very, uh, not, not turbulent, but very, a lot of tension. And people, instead of staying in meeting, just left. You know, and I think that's what we have more of now. There's more of at least, there needs to be more conversation and more sharing of where I am, who I am, you know, and... and and, you know, the, there's that fact section of, well, I speak Spanish, you don't. Well, I'm better. Well, not really, because no, no, not, no, I'm not just that. Really. No, you're not. But I was brought up differently than you are. You know, everybody's different. That's okay. But we don't, and, and that, that still happens now. We don't do enough to see our differences and accept them. Instead of just saying, oh, you're that, so you stay over there. We get mad because we get segregated. We segregate ourselves at times when we really shouldn't. And um, just one last question here, uh, just regarding the leaders in the Latino community that you uh, uh, kind of look, looked up to. You mentioned Rufino Mendoza. And yeah, um, Mr. Zapata. He was a good man. He'd always, he and I had always, his son and I played football at Nolan together. And we, he, even, to the, even to a few years ago, we'd always, I'd always try to, whenever I run into him, his felt started declining. We'd just laugh or I'd ask him if he knew some stuff about my dad. And, and then he'd share and he'd ramble. I tell people, go sit with an older person. Just let them, give them something and then let them go and then just listen. Because you'll be surprised how you know this family. I found out uh, towards a couple years before my dad passed away that the Mercados that lived on, on the other side of, uh, on the other side of uh, Maine with my dad, their grandmother was my father's godmother. I never knew that. And I was like, because Mr. Mercado, uh, Jake Mercado, not Jake Mercado, um, Benito Mercado uh, told me, he goes, yeah, he goes, we're sitting there one day at a basketball game, and we're just sitting there talking, and he goes, have you seen your dad? And my dad passed away. He goes, oh, no, he's, yeah, he's at the house, blah, 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 I haven't talked to him in a couple of days. And then he goes, hey, you know that my, my grandparents, my abuelitos, were his godparents? And I was like, really, I mean, just little things that you're connected to someone, like, really, I never knew that. And the weird thing is, his youngest, his, uh, he has two daughters, his youngest daughter and her husband are my oldest son's godparents. There's so much connection at times that, yeah. you know, that, that people say, oh, you're all Latinos are related. Yeah, we are in more ways than one, you know, but it's just the community and, and what we've tried to foster, I think. And some of that is going away just because now we're moving into the suburbs and, and north side. You know, back then, north side or south side, oh, Pali, that, well, that's bad areas. Not really, not anymore. There's still some pockets, you know, but not like it used to be. And that's because why people are taking ownership or they're coming back. So... Mm -hmm. Alrighty, I think this uh, wraps it up. Okay. So, uh, kind of went a little bit over the time, but no, it's okay. No okay. Alrighty, well, thanks all for your time. Thank you. Uh, oh, and then uh, the uh, so you have that. Um, we have an our archivist down, archivist downstairs. Um, that's going to be um, with the city of Fort Worth, uh, the uh, library, mm -hmm. uh, and she is. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um,